The first and probably in many ways the most important is the law of similars, um, which is better you know boiled down to like cures like. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories about how Hahnemann used cinchona bark and, you know, treating malaria and all these sorts of things. And um, certainly that's true, but Hahnemann didn't invent that idea, right? Um, he, he discovered it um, on a more uh, foundational basis with the herbs and remedies and things he was using. But the idea of like cures like has been around for a very long time. Uh, in fact, the um, you know the the two countries currently that have the most homeopathic doctors per capita, I guess, are India and Brazil. And uh, long before Hahnemann ever discovered the law of similars for himself and for the medicine, um, you know, people in the country of India were using um, the idea of like cures like. Um, for lots of things, and it's often used um, in eclectic herbalism as well. Um, you know, the, the Native American Indians had um, herbs that did a very similar thing. So essentially what it means is that you're taking a small, small, small dose of the thing that has caused the condition, right? So um, you know, belladonna is a very uh, good example or easy example in this instance, and some of you may know this remedy. Um, it's a huge remedy in the Materia Medica for um, homeopathy. Um, if all of us, um, you know, were to sit down and chew a bunch of belladonna, um, we would be poisoning ourselves, and all of the uh, symptoms for someone who needs belladonna would be present in us from having taken a large dose of belladonna. Um, so symptoms like perhaps a high fever, um, perhaps a very flushed red face, um, a very acute, quick-acting uh, type of uh, symptomology. Uh, these would all be um, uh, symptoms that we would see, you know, uh, very um, uh, anything where the sympathetic nervous system is ramped up, ramped up very high, uh, so-called vagolytic symptoms. Um, that was that would be what we would see if we took belladonna um, at a very high dose. We see these symptoms in a patient, not someone who took belladonna, but we see these types of symptoms in a patient, say someone who's suffering from acute pharyngitis. We give them belladonna in homeopathic form, very very small and it sort of resets the organism. It actually allows them to let go of all that symptomology. They're, they're no longer stagnant and st stuck uh, with that symptomology. Uh, so I hope that that clears up a little bit of law of similars. I'm sure uh, people have a lot more questions about that and um, you know, if there's some afterwards, we'll talk about it. Um, it's the most confusing but also the most important uh, law, if you will. The law of the single remedy um, you know, when, when Hahnemann first started, this was a, a more clear-cut thing, um, the idea of what does one at a time mean, how far apart does one at a time mean, does that mean one per day or one per hour, or what does that mean? Well, essentially what it means uh, from, for our purposes is uh, I see the patient, they come in to see me, and they need belladonna. They don't need any other remedies. I don't give them five remedies to take home and say, hey, take all five of these and see, hope that something happens, right? Um, I give them belladonna because that's the exact remedy that they need the most, right? That they're the most like. And so um, certainly later in his life, um, towards the, the end of his career as a physician, Hahnemann, used, um, you know, you take one remedy in the morning and then a remedy in the afternoon and a remedy in the evening. Um, so this got a little bit more uh, loosey-goosey, if you will, as time went on and um, the idea of when that one at a time, where, where do we make that, that break um, is not as clear. But true constitutional homeopathy states that you give the one remedy, that's the remedy the patient needs. 
right? Maybe they come back a month later and they need a new remedy, but you gave them that one remedy to sort of shift them and move them to the next place they needed to go. Um, law of uh, infinitesimal dose, you, you have to use the smallest dose amount for cure, right? You don't give the patient um, a whole spoonful of it when a tiny little drop will do, right? You give them the potency and the amount that's needed for them to achieve cure. Um, I'm not really going to go into uh, potencies in this talk. Um, it could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, there's there's entire volumes written about the difference between potencies, and there's a lot of competing philosophies about, um, you know, which potent potencies we should use and which we shouldn't, and these types of things. So um, I don't want there to be too much confusion, uh, other than to say that really what we should be doing as practitioners is giving our patients just what they need to get better, no more, no less, and um, and that's kind of what that law means to me the most. Um, the final law, the law of direction of cure, and you know, to be honest, I'm not totally sure, um, I don't really think that Hahnemann, Hahnemann certainly abided by this law, but I'm not sure he actually wrote it down. He may have, but my, my history may be a little off there, but um, I typically refer to this law as Herring's law. Um, Constantine Herring was another famous homeopath um, and uh, has done a lot of work and uh, in in the field, and this law is typically attributed to him. To him. Um, certainly, what it means is, as the patient's curing from their symptomology, they're going to cure from superior to inferior, up to down. Um, they're going to cure from the inside to the out, right? So things are going to come from their digestive system out through their skin, right? Um, more important to less important, and in that since it means organ systems, right? So if the problem is in their brain, it's going to go from the brain to, you know, perhaps the the stomach, right? Um, if it's in the, it might move to, um, you know, the spleen or something like that, right? A more important organ to a less important. Um, certainly all the organs are important. I don't mean to, to uh, debase the stomach or... Uh, the spleen and say they're less important organs, I'm sure the stomach and spleen would be very uh, upset with me if that were the case, but um, meaning we can't really live without our brain having, you know, good blood flow and oxygen and glucose, um, and you can't live without your liver, right? And the symptoms are going to go reverse order of appearance, right? So maybe the first symptom the patient experienced was, um, you know, some skin trouble, right? But five years down the line, now they have severe uh, gastrointestinal problems, and as they get cured, the, the GI problems will go away, and that skin stuff will return as they're curing. Um, and, and we do see that. You know, it's very common in things like asthma, um, eczema, uh, the sort of atopic triad for, for children. We see that that reverse order quite frequently. And typically children are easier to treat anyway and you see the symptoms more um, pronounced and you see the changes more pronounced just simply because they have less junk in the way. Um, treating children and treating pets um, are often great ways to see homeopathy in action because as adults, you know, we have a lot of garbage, right? We got a lot of of stuff in the way for us. We have a whole life's worth of um, emotional baggage and physical baggage and all these things, and sometimes it's hard to sort of poke through all that and get to uh, the thing that's most important, right? So, in short, um, constitutional homeopathy is hard, right? That's the that's the the dirty truth and the most difficult thing to discuss about it is that. It's very, very difficult to become a skilled practitioner in. <clears throat> Excuse me. It is very effective. Um, I've seen it and used it in action, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, and uh, it's amazing in its, uh, you know, effectiveness. But it's limited somehow, right? Uh, one way it's limited is that you uh, only get the one remedy. So what if you mess up, right? What if um, 
what if you are a good doc but you just you know you just choose the wrong one I, I mean I, I don't want to make maybe darting playing dart not darting but playing darts is the best um, you know is the best uh, reference here but you don't always hit a bullseye every time right maybe you hit right around the bullseye or you hit a little further out you still score points right but you didn't get exactly right on the nose and that's the problem with one remedy at a time is that um, it leaves very little room for error, right? And, and to get to a place where you have little error as a practitioner takes years and years and years and years of practice, right? So that's, that's difficult. Um, you know, many, many doctors that um, trained me when I was a student um, basically told me it's going to take you 10 to 15 years which is a long time, right? Uh, it's a long time to be practicing, and it's a long time to make a bunch of mistakes um, with homeopathy. And, um, you know, I don't know what sorts of, um, you know, practices any of the people listening plan on having, but, um, you know, my patients are not going to stick around with me for 15 years while I make mistakes. They want to get better pretty quickly, and, and I want them to get better pretty quickly. So, um, I'm trying to do whatever I can to help them get better fast, right? In, in the most, um, you know, uh, not necessarily fast, but the 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 best speed at which they can effectively do it, right? Um, like anything else that's been written down, um, you know, religion would be a good example, or um, you know, even some uh, scientific thought. There's a there's tons of competing philosophies, right? Um, you're going to hear people who say, no, Hahnemann said this and he meant this, and the same person will take that same quote from Hahnemann and say, no, he meant this by that that quote, right? Um, you know, things are translated and retranslated, and um, so that there, there, a lot of philosophies are born out of that sort of competition for what is right. <clears throat> but ultimately, um, you know, they're, they're, you have to find what's right for you as a practitioner, and that also takes practice, you know. So what defines as true constitutional homeopathy or what defines the true constitutional remedies, you're going to see tons of um, competing philosophies about that. So don't get confused. Just try to use them as a guide to find your way through the medicine. Um, you know, I, I say over 3,000 potential remedies. Well, that could mean 10,000 or 100,000. Um, it doesn't really matter. The point is there's lots of choices, right? So if a patient comes in, sits down across from you, you have an hour and a half visit with them, you ask them all these, these questions, they tell you all of these things, and you're narrowing down from, you know, 3,000 or 3,500 or whatever it is to try and get to one, that's a pretty tough job, right? That's a pretty tough thing to do because you have so many choices. So it can be very daunting as a practitioner. Well, maybe it's this one or this one. I don't know. Well, it's got to be one of these five, and I really want to know which one of the five it is, and you're trying to um, narrow it down. Well, there's lots of choice there, and there's lots of confusion, and that's another thing that makes constitutional homeopathy very difficult to be skilled at doing. So let's talk about um, a different philosophy um, that is in the homeopathic realm, right, but not necessarily, or, or certainly not considered constitutional. In fact, some people don't even consider it homeopathy, um, either to be disparaging of it or not. Um, it, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, it is a therapy, right? It's a form of, a form of um, helping patients with energetic medicine. So biotherapeutic drainage or drainage um, began in the early 1900s. It sprung out of Belgium, and um, the doctors who put it together or started sort of combining these things, you know, really combined a lot of philo philosophies here. Um, they used the sort of Western, Western eclectic herbalism that they were well steeped in, um, being in Western Europe. Um, they used homeopathy, which pretty well um, because they, you know, were in Western Europe, and they also blended some Eastern modalities, um, some ideas from, uh, you know, Chinese medicine, um, even a little bit of Ayurvedic medicine and these types of things. 
<coughs> excuse me, which makes um, makes for an interesting sort of uh, philosophical soup, if you will, or melting pot kind of idea. So you have um, blended homeopathics in these uh, remedies, which consist of different herbs, different metals, different, different minerals, blended in specific recipes. And they have different um, you know, potencies in there, sometimes 6x or 12x or 10c. Um, the, the recipes were sort of devised um, as they were putting this together, which things worked best with each other. And they have specific recipes and specific dilutions. And these remedies focus on systems, right? They don't focus on symptoms. There's no uh, symptomatic approach. You don't say, well, my patient has headaches, so you give them the remedy that's for headaches. It doesn't work like that. Um, you take a step back from the patient, you look at them holistically, and you say, what is out of balance here? And then you try to treat that imbalance, right? So the homeopathics are given to try and bring balance back to the organism. And in doing so, you really, um, you know, help con the, the symptoms go away, right? You're looking at the systems, you bring the systems into balance, and the symptoms aren't there anymore because now you have balance. And the thing that was causing this, the symptoms are no longer present, right? One good thing about it and one difference is, um, at least with the type of uh, drainage therapy that I use, um, there's only 76 remedies, right? So you only have 76 to choose from. So instead of 3,000 or 3,500 or 10,000 or 100,000, whatever it may be with constitutional homeopathy, you've got 76 which still is kind of daunting, right? You've got to know those 76 remedies pretty well, but um, it's a lot better than 3,000, right? So it's a little bit easier. Um, of course, with those 76, you can still make almost infinite combinations. So you can really treat anything um, and help with anything. So um, I, I, I want to be clear, I don't have any stake with um, Unda, Saroyal, or Genestra. It's not a company I own stock in. I don't get paid by them. Um, I'm not employed by them. Um, I use their products. Um, the, this is the company that I use. There are other companies that, um, that make drainage therapies, um, but when I learn the drainage and in my practice of using drainage, uh, this is the system that I use. And often remedies are chosen in groups of three or groups of four. So I'm using those three or four remedies to um, dictate or tell me uh, what uh, systems need the most support with the body, right? So that's what I'm uh, using those, those uh, remedies to show. Um, often this is, biotherapeutic drainage is often called uh, using UNDA numbers. So you can see on there the UNDA company. Um, that's the company in Belgium that um, you know was created to create all of these drainage therapies. So um, sometimes we just collectively call them UNDA numbers because instead of giving the remedies a name like belladonna or causticum or whatever remedy, um, constitutional remedies you may know, uh, the specific blends that they made, they just, just call them by number. Not very creative, but it's how they did it, right? So those numbers have stuck around, and um, you use the numbers in groups of three or groups of four, um, and they, spoke, they focus on the specific body systems. Um, so again, UNDA is owned by UNDA Saroyal Genestra, which is a company um, that uh, bought UNDA and now owns them and distributes them worldwide. Um, we're going to look at a couple diagrams, um, and I think some of this will make a little bit more sense to you um, when we look at the organ systems. But um, again, I just want to be clear. Uh, I use this specific system because this is this is how I was trained, and this is what I've what I've uh, 
gravitated towards working with my patients because it works the best for me. Okay. So if you look here, um, this is a uh, a body system. I'll go back one page really quickly. So we've looked at the diagram. Let's go back one page. Um, a lot of what the diagram is based on is from Anthroposophy, which is a um, you know medical philosophical system um, really brought into vogue by Dr. Rudolf Steiner, and um, so some of his Anthroposophy, some of his thought about how the body develops is also imbued into how the drainage therapies are used. Um, so you can see the ages um, based around what organ systems and how they're developing. And the ages are basically saying, oh, this is how inner this is when energetically this organ system is developing, right? So it's when the energy of the body is focusing most of its energy on making this happen, right? So, for instance, if a trauma takes place at age five, right, well, it may affect the GI system because that's the time when it's developing, but it may also affect the lung, the cardiovascular, the endocrine, the nervous system. It may affect every, every system that is developing after that time, right? So a lot of a lot of times with patients, I end up going backwards, right? We, we start taking care of, of balancing systems where they're at today, right now, and then we walk backwards in time to get to a place where um, we can really look at these systems specifically and say, hey, that's where the, the real trauma or the real damage or the real um, instigating event took place, and now we can start working on that so the body can remold itself in this new this new light right so nothing to get super worked up about but um, it's a it's a way of looking at these body systems and how they're connected to each other right um, oftentimes I'll look at things across the the diagram so for instance nervous system and kidney have a, a correlation to each other one being the first one being the last system and sometimes things that affect the kidney also affect the the nervous system heavily, right? So I may be trying to treat the nervous system by using kidney stabilizing remedies, right? Um, again, I don't want to be too out of left field or confusing, but uh, it's one way to use this diagram to help support um, body systems by looking at a competing system and saying, oh, that's the thing that really needs the most support, okay? So pros and cons, I mean, I've, I've talked a little bit about the two. Um, from where I stand, you know, neither of these philosophies is better than the other, right? They're just different. Um, certainly, uh, my goal in te teaching students is to always help people find the thing that makes the most sense to them. Um, I have many colleagues who don't do, don't practice like me at all, but their patients still get help their patients still get cured, their patients still get wellness. So it doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. It means that um, there's a lot of ways that we can help patients get better. And you've got to find the philosophy and the treatment modalities that make the most sense to you. Um, so I use both of these um, in treating patients. Um, I definitely use a little bit of constitutional. I definitely use a lot of drainage. and. Uh, I feel like I need both of them because that's the philosophy that makes the most sense to me. Um, when a patient really needs a single remedy, I, I, I know they need that single remedy and I uh, give them the remedy. If I feel like they need more of the drainage therapies, then we go in that direction. Okay? So drainage and natural therapies together, um, yeah. Uh, uh, maybe um, kind of silly, but as I say in the first bullet there, in short, it's a good idea to use them together. Um, I use um, some nutraceuticals. I use herbal medicine. I use drainage therapies. I use cell salts. I use, yeah, you name it, right? I use whatever's at my disposal to help patients achieve wellness, right? Whatever the patient needs, that's what the most important piece is here, right? 
not I'm so married to my philosophy that I refuse to um, try anything different or do anything else for the patient. I just want to give patients um, constitutional homeopathy because that's how I do. I, I'm not really into dogmatic thought like that. So uh, I think it's a good idea to use all of these together in the way that feels most natural for you. Um, I think that one of the reasons that we need um, probably a combination of these things is we don't live in Hahnemann's time anymore, right? It's not the late 1700s. Um, the world is much more toxic, much more polluted, uh, much more damaged than it was, you know, really since uh, it's a stark difference today in 2014 than it was even in 1914, right? It's only only 100 years, and the world is a very, very different place with um, the amount of technology that has allowed us to, uh, you know, change our food supply so heavily and pollute the water so heavily and all these sorts of things. So, you know, Hahnemann was a uh, really um, – he was very ahead of his time in saying that uh, there should be, you know, you should have clean air and you should have clean food and you should have water. Um, the idea of germ theory and, and those types of things, they did not exist in Hahnemann's time. He was one of the first physicians that suggested that people should wash their hands, um, which was really unheard of at that time. Bloodletting and um, other sorts of therapies, sort of brutal therapies were the, the name of the game in, in the medical field. And he was sort of a, a contrarian in saying, maybe, the, maybe we should think about this in a different way. Maybe we should look at this from a different point of view. And um, truly, we need those things even more today, right? We need the clean food and clean air and clean water. We need all of those things. Um, but I definitely use uh, all of these together. And if done correctly, they don't really interfere with the action of homeopathy or drainage remedies. Um, I definitely have people take them apart from each other. I don't have them all throw everything into a glass and drink it all. Um, but they don't compete um, for wellness. Um, in fact, they can really, really um, advocate for each other, if you will, in the body. Uh, sometimes it's good to throw the body a little bit off balance so it can bring itself back. Um, Another diagram that's really important, I often show this to my patients. So one of the things that makes, um, and, and if you've had a class with me, I'm, sh I'm sure uh, you're familiar with this term and we talk about it. One of the things that makes drainage therapies so powerful is the fact that they work on our amuncteries. And the amuncteries are what we see here, right? Our lungs, our kidney, our, our GI, um, our liver, our skin. Um, the amuncteries are the organs of elimination in the body, right? And we've got to um, we've got to improve the ability of those uh, organs to let go of the toxicity that they accumulate on a daily basis, right? So you can see sort of the spigot on the lower left side of the bucket, right? We've got to open up that spigot and allow things to drain out, right? Or we've got to really work on making sure that not, you know, less toxic stuff is being shoved into the top of the bucket there, right? Otherwise, it's going to spill over. And when it spills over, that's when symptoms are present, right? That's when symptoms show up. When it's spilling over with toxicity, that's when the body can't handle it anymore. And now you have all these, these symptoms. And the symptoms may be as simple as, oh, I have some eczema, or it may be, oh, now I have seizures all the time, right? We don't know what those symptoms are going to be because it's very unpredictable once the bucket starts spilling over, right? We don't know which direction the toxicity is going to spill out of. So wound numbers and drainage therapies and homeopathy and herbs and aromatherapy, all these things are focused on trying to help the body get rid of these things better, but I haven't found anything that works as exquisitely well as drainage therapies um, and helping the amuncteries open up and drain, right? So, um, this sort of diagram wasn't needed back in the late 1700s, right? You, it wasn't as toxic of a world. You could give someone a homeopathic remedy and they would respond pretty dramatically. Nowadays, people don't respond that way unless they're really, their body's really ready for it, at least not in my experience. Um, so 
again, like I said, um, I want to do two things when it comes to among trees. I want to improve the body's ability to get rid of toxicity, right? And I also want to eliminate the extra toxicity that they're that's coming into the body. So we've got to talk about diet. We've got to talk about nutrition. We've got to talk about um, their water quality and the air quality and all these sorts of things, right? I want less toxicity coming in and more toxicity leaving. And uh, if we can do that, then I have found in a vast number of patients, symptoms just start going away. Um, so most natural therapeutics focus on improving among tree function somehow on some level, where, whether it's metabolic or it's, um, you know, true physical, more organic um, changes. Uh, natural therapeutics tend to focus on this, right? So uh, my main focus is helping patients improve with uh, lungs, skin, GI, kidney, body systems with their daily activities. So part of my treatment plans involve some of these things, right? What we call the BTGs, and BTG stands for Basic Treatment Guidelines. Um, so everybody gets a basic treatment, right? And their basic treatment starts with things that I would give every single patient for the most part, regardless of what their condition is. <laughs> Deep breathing exercises and castor oil packs, which I'm not gonna go into, um, making sure they're drinking the right amount of water, they have a good diet, they're, they're taking a, um, the right amount of fish oil, a good dose of probiotics, you know, maybe some vitamins and minerals if they need that. Something they're doing on a daily basis to help improve um, the basic ability of these amunctories to function. In general, um, all of the drainage therapies improve some amunctory function. It's not true across the board of the 76 remedies, but most of them focus on the uh, detoxification of certain of the cells in whatever system that you're focused on, right? And these other, um, these other tactics help that too. Um, you know, a lot of people think, uh, oh, well, supplements are not bad for you. I'll just take as many as I want. Well, really, in, in my practice, I see patients take way too many supplements as well. And you take 15 supplements a day, it's not that much different than taking, you know, eight, eight drugs a day. Um, the side effects may, may not be as bad, but it's just as clogging and toxic for your body. So I'm trying to get my patients to take less and less stuff, not more and more stuff. So um, I've touched on all these things a little bit, but to, to sort of bring it back home, um, we have a much more polluted world now. We have a much more toxic world, and we need a more effective solution to um, help that less toxic, you know, let the person rise out of the toxicity a little bit more. Um, and so drainage is the thing that I've used to help patients get to that place. Um, we improve amongtry function, we eliminate cellular waste, right? And once we do that, right, once we clear the cobwebs, I can see more of the true patient, right? I can see them for who they really are. I can see their constitution better. I can see how they respond to things better. I can see the true person. And when I can see the true person, homeopathy becomes a lot easier. Right? I'm not chasing symptoms around a tree. Uh, I can look at them and I can talk to them and I can see how they respond and I can really see what remedy they are. Right? I know they need causticum or I know they need silica because there's no more of this garbage in the way of seeing the true patient. Right? So uh, we can get rid of all those sort of um, consequential pathological states and we can see what the true pathology, if any, exists underneath. And uh, that's why I feel like drainage is so much more functional in the toxic world that we live in. Um, so thinking that we don't have um, a polluted internal world because the external world is polluted is kind of silly. Um, we are breathing this air. We are drinking this water, right? We are um, in an environment where media and uh, consumption of media is rampant, right? So we have all of these things sort of spinning around us, and we've got to do something to protect the internal environment from the external world somehow, 
right? So many practitioners I know um, use other things besides drainage therapies to achieve this protection. Um, I know many very, very skilled herbalists that only use herbs and um, they go about um, achieving this end in by using herbal medicine, right? Um, some people use combination homeopathics, some people use um, you know, cell salts for instance. Um, there's many, many uh, roads to Rome here, so uh, I, I don't mean to imply that the way I do it is better than anybody else, um, but nothing I have used in my practice helps do I see such an improvement in a monkery function in patients other than drainage therapies. It's the thing that I've seen be the most effective. But um, that's, you know, that's just me. So I think that we can use homeopathy if we can find a way to find the true patient, right? I think we can use homeopathy very effectively if we can get rid of this toxicity. And that's the, that tends to be the thing that's sort of in the way, right? It's the, it's the barrier to good health, okay? So I am uh, at the point where I think it's probably a good idea to um, leave the floor open for some questions.